Well, good, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2012 Hayward Lectures. My name is Craig Evans. I teach New Testament at Acadia Divinity College, and I also serve as the director of the Hayward Lectures. Well, tonight I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you our speaker, Professor C. Stephen Evans. He's got a good name there, I think. <laughs> Now, we're a little bit out of sequence. Normally, uh, Harry Gardner, the president of Acadia Divinity College, uh, introduces our speaker and the Hayward Lectures the first evening. <coughs> Harry is in New Brunswick, and he'll be back tomorrow, and he'll be with us tomorrow evening. So I'll leave, him, leave it to him to introduce the uh, Hayward Lectures themselves. So what I'll do tonight is introduce our speaker. <coughs> Uh, professor Evans is at uh, Baylor University as professor of philosophy. He's been there since 2001. He did his PhD at Yale University in the 1970s. And uh, since that time, he's won an, a number of awards and honors. He has served on numerous uh, journal boards as an editor or as an editorial board member. And uh, from my own experience, I can really appreciate that. That's, that's uh, serious labor and labor of love, doing all of that. He has taught at Wheaton College from 1974 to 1984. From 1984 to 94, he was at St. Olaf College in Minnesota. And from 1994 to 2001, he's been on the faculty of Calvin College. And as I said, from 2001 to the present, he's been a distinguished professor at Baylor University. He's published a number of books, uh, too numerous to mention all of them, but I will mention a few. Passionate Reason, Making Sense of Kierkegaard's Philosophical Fragments, that was published in 20 years ago in 1992. Why Believe, Reason and Mystery as Pointers to God, published in 1996. And then a book that really caught my attention because of my interest in the uh, quest of the historical Jesus, a book entitled The Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith, The Incarnational Narrative as History. Um, some of you who know this discipline know that he's taken these concepts playfully and turned them on their head. We usually speak of the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith, but his title puts that in another perspective. More recently, he's published Kierkegaard's Ethic of Love, Divine Commands and Moral Requirements in Oxford University Press 2004. Kierkegaard on Faith and the Self, collected essays uh, just very recently, and then an introduction, which has just come out, has it? Your Kierkegaard, an introduction, or is it still in press? 2009, 2009 it has been out. Your web page needs to be updated. Anyway, I brought along a couple of, of his books. Uh, this one just out, Natural Signs and Knowledge of God, a new look at theistic arguments that is very current and very much uh, speaks very importantly to things that have been in the air in recent uh, years as you know we also have some of his books on the table here's one of them why believe reason and mystery as pointers to God and so I draw that to your attention it will be on the book table in the back the lecture series uh, is titled Christian belief in the 21st century and the subtitle narrows that down, Responding to the New Atheism. It's a very important field of study. Everybody's heard of Richard Dawkins, of course, and the God Delusion, and some prominent and noisy uh, new atheists in recent years. And so I really look forward to these lectures. And then just a matter of housekeeping, I remind you that we do have evaluation forms. This information is very helpful for us in uh, determining things like format and, and topics for future selection. There's a blue sheet. It's just like this. It's on the book table. So during the reception time that will follow, I would ask you to fill one of these out and leave it at the table. The lecture will begin in just a few, mo a few minutes. Should Christians engage in natural theology? That'll be the topic uh, for tonight. Uh, the lecture will run about 50 minutes or so. There will be time, maybe a little bit more than that, but there will be time following that 
for questions and answers. And as the, uh, we approach 9 o'clock, we'll break it off at some point as the uh, questions uh, begin to wind down. And there will be some refreshments out in the foyer, and you'll have your opportunity uh, to uh, peruse and look at the books uh, on the book table. Not only are there books by Professor Evans, but also some books relating to uh, our previous Hayward lectures and our Acadia Studies in Bible and Theology series. So without further ado, I want to invite uh, Professor Evans to come up here and uh, begin his lectures. Thank you very much, Steve. Let's welcome him. Well, thank you, uh, Craig, for that very warm and generous uh, introduction. I, I uh, really appreciate this invitation. It's my first visit to Nova Scotia. I don't know how I managed to live this long without coming to this place. It's so beautiful. And my wife and I have had a splendid time. I can assure you that we will not wait so long to come back. <laughs> we'll find an excuse uh, to visit this beautiful part of the world. And I'm really honored to give the Hayward Lectures. I looked at the list of people who have given these lectures, and it's quite stunning, quite a, quite a good group to be included in. Uh, my students don't think I deserve it, but that's all right. Uh, I'm here anyway, so <laughs> missing class all week playing hooky. So it's, it's wonderful to be with you. So the general topic, Christian belief in the 21st century responding to the new atheism, Tonight I want to address the basic question of whether natural theology is still a viable option. Is it something Christians should try to do? If so, how should we do it? That'll be the topic of the second lecture, how to do it. Tonight, should we do it? And if so, how do we go about it? That's the main project. So, whoops. I, uh, what did I just do? There we go. <laughs> I shouldn't confess this, You'll think I'm a terrible Luddite and you'll be right, but this is the first time in my life I've ever used PowerPoint. So. <laughs> and so today, preparing for this in a last minute panic, what if the technology doesn't work? I decided at the last minute to do an old fashioned handout, which you also have, just in case I couldn't manage the PowerPoint. Uh, and then I see when I get here, there's a terrible typo in the first line but I, I will apologize to the new atheists. I don't really think they are horse meat. It's supposed to be the four horsemen. <laughs> From the earliest periods of the Christian church, God has called some to defend the faith against the attacks of unbelievers. In the ancient world, early Christians were variously accused of being atheists because of their rejection of local gods, superstitious because of their acceptance of miracles such as the resurrection of Jesus, and subverters of the social order because of their refusal to worship the emperor and their inclusion of people of all social classes in their communities. Such writers as Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen responded to all of these charges and more. Many apologists have taken 1 Peter 3.15 as providing a kind of charter for the apologetic enterprise. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Now, Peter may not be referring directly to what has come today to be known as apologetics, but it does seem that this verse implies that Christian hope is not baseless or groundless. A person who possesses Christian faith can approach the world with an attitude of hope, regardless of what transpires in this world, and this hope is one that is reasonable, at least from the perspective of faith. Now recently, a number of writers, collectively often termed the New Atheists, have loudly claimed that Christian faith is anything but reasonable. What should the church say in response to such claims? I'm going to try in these three lectures to answer this question, but first, I'll say something briefly about the New Atheists. Who are they? What exactly are their accusations against religious faith in general and Christian faith in particular? There are a host of writers one could include under the label of the New Atheism, but I'm going to limit my discussion to the four best-known writers, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, and Daniel Dennett, a quartet sometimes described as the four horsemen of the movement. 
though perhaps one should say the four horsemen are now only a trio since Christopher Hitchens passed away from pneumonia stemming from cancer in 2011. Dawkins, an evolutionary uh, biologist now at Oxford, first came to public attention with the publication of The Selfish Gene in 1976, a popular work in evolutionary biology that proposed that the organism should be considered as merely a way that genes use to reproduce themselves. More recently, Dawkins argued that the universe is fully intelligible without any, without any resort to any intelligent design or cause in The Blind Watchmaker from 1986, and that religious belief is not only irrational but positively harmful in The God Delusion 2006. Dawkins is unafraid to voice his contempt for biblical faith Quote, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philosocidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. A real test of one's pronunciation abilities. Christopher Hitchens, educated at Oxford, was a British leftist, Trotskyite in fact, who made a living as a journalist writing for The Nation, The New Statesman, and for a variety of American publications including The Atlantic and Vanity Fair. Besides his regular work as a journalist, Hitchens wrote a series of mostly biographical books, some on figures he admired such as George Orwell, Thomas Paine, and Thomas Jefferson, and others on figures he detested. Henry Kissinger, and Mother Teresa, no less. Hitchens acquired some notoriety by deserting his leftist friends and giving wholehearted support to the American-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. But however much his politics may have changed, he remained consistent to the end in his vehement opposition to religious belief. God is not great, how religion poisons everything, expresses his view that religion is not only false, but pernicious, a cancer that right-thinking people should try to extirpate. Hitchens is probably even more quotable than Dawkins and is similarly unafraid to voice his outrage that religion manages to persist in the contemporary world. Faith is the surrender of the mind. It's the surrender of reason. It's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other mammals. It's our need to believe and to surrender our skepticism and our reason, our yearning to discard that and put all our trust or faith in someone or something. That's the sinister thing to me. Of all the supposed virtues, faith must be the most overrated. Sam Harris received a PhD in neuroscience, but he's really best known for his vociferous attacks on religious belief. His books include The End of Faith from 2004, Letter to a Christian Nation, 2006, a short response to the criticisms his first book received. He's recently written The Moral Landscape, in which he argues that ethical questions can and should be answered scientifically, a, view, a book which I might say has been reviewed rather harshly by atheistic philosophers. <laughs> no friend of religion, but they don't like what he has to say about ethics. And also a short book on free will. Harris's attacks on religious belief, like those of Dawkins and Hitchens, don't focus solely on fundamentalism or extremist forms of religion. He thinks even moderate forms of religious belief are destructive and harmful to our civilization. We will see that the greatest problem confronting civilization is not merely religious extremism, it is the larger set of cultural and intellectual accommodations we have made to faith itself. Oops. I just went too far. Okay, the last of the four horsemen I shall briefly describe is Daniel Dennett, a philosopher at Tufts University, best known for his work in the philosophy of mind and on free will, particularly with respect to the question of whether artificially constructed machines could ever be said to be conscious. Although Dennett's views in philosophy of mind, like all such views currently on offer, are controversial and hotly debated, he has won a reputation as an accomplished and influential philosopher in this area through such books as Brainstorms from 1978, I've used it as a text, The Intentional Stance from 1987, and Consciousness Explained from 1991, 
though it is a standing joke among other philosophers that Dennett should have called that last book Consciousness Explained Away. In 1995, Dennett shifted from narrow issues in the philosophy of mind to broader questions about a naturalistic worldview. He defended the power of Darwinism to explain just about everything in Darwin's dangerous idea. He moved further towards explicit criticism of religion in 2006, Breaking the Spell, which on the surface is simply a call for the scientific study of religion, as, but as the title implies, he suggests in the book that such study will break the hole that religion holds on the minds and lives of people. After the publication of Breaking the Spell, Dennett uh, participated in a memorable exchange with Alvin Plantinga, distinguished Christian philosopher, at the American Philosophical Association. And that exchange, along with replies from each philosopher to the other, has been published as Science and Religion, Are They Compatible? So what do these four horsemen have to say to us? What, if anything, is new about the new atheism? Well, I really think there's really very little new in many ways in the attacks on religion mounted by these four thinkers. There are frequent denunciations of religion as outmoded and primitive, grand claims that religion is unscientific. Religious beliefs are described as simply preposterous for a scientifically educated person. In fact, Sam Harris claims that if the kinds of beliefs held by religious people were not so widely shared, religious belief would be a symptom of mental illness. He thinks that really the only reason religious people are not regarded as mentally ill is that there are so many of us. <laughs> uh, however, I think there is actually little in the way of detailed arguments to back up these grand claims. And in reality, none of the four horsemen has any real competence in the philosophy of religion or, to my knowledge, much familiarity even with classical and contemporary debates in the field. I have, in fact, heard privately from atheist friends of mine who are philosophers that they find the writings of the new atheists somewhat embarrassing in terms of their intellectual uh, uh, level. In any case, the assertions that religious beliefs are unsupported by evidence and have somehow been undermined by science have been stock claims made by atheists since at least the early 19th century. The idea that a naturalistic or materialistic worldview is somehow a more scientific view, and I'm going to discuss this idea, is practically a cliché. There are, to be sure, a few novel arguments for the falsity of religious belief, uh, such as Richard Dawkins' uh, claim that... Um, Dawkins has a claim that uh, if we posit God to explain the design of the natural order, that's a very implausible thing to do, he says, because any God capable of designing anything would have to be complex enough to demand the same kind of explanation in his own right. And he says this would lead to an infinite regress of causes. In other words, if God created the world and he's the one who explains the world, God must be at least as complex as the world, and so we would need an explanation of God. It's hard for me to understand how an argument that seems to me so obviously weak could be confidently put forward by a man of Dawkins' intelligence, but he apparently thinks he's come up with a real Lollapalooza, a real haymaker that will uh, vanish uh, any, any kind of religious belief. But anyone with a real knowledge of the history of theology would know that one of the traditional attributes of God, and this goes all the way back to Plato, well before Christian thinkers, is divine simplicity. Any being with parts, certainly any being with material parts, would just not be God, simply because of that fact. Dawkins' argument actually mimics another classical argument for God's existence, the cosmological argument, which holds that one must postulate a simple uncaused cause of the universe, precisely because an infinite regress of causes is impossible, and that's the only way to stop the regress. But even if one rejects the classical theistic conception of God as a simple being, Dawkins' premise that God to be the cause of a complex universe would have to be at least as complex as that universe seems really weak. It's hard to see why is he so confident of the premise, which seems to be like every cause must always be at least as complex as its effect. I see no reason to think that premise is, is true. Uh, there's, he certainly presents no evidence for it. So, uh, most of the new atheist criticisms of religious belief, on my view, turn out to be familiar and not new at all. 
When they do present genuinely new arguments, they often seem too weak to even warrant a serious rebuttal. There are, however, elements in the writings of the New Atheists that do seem new. One is a brash confidence that the New Atheists have in their anti-religious claims and a willingness to assert them loudly and publicly. The New Atheists don't want to write articles for philosophy periodicals. They want to write bestsellers that will command cultural attention, and they've been successful at doing that. A second element that is at least relatively new is a conviction that relig religious beliefs are not only false and unreasonable, but ethically and socially harmful. Now, older atheists sometimes made such arguments, but the new atheists are absolutely convinced that many of the social ills that beset the 21st century can be traced to the feet of religion, including wars, violence of all kinds, sexism, and homophobia. They think that in the past, some atheists gave religion too much credit for the good things that happen in society. Uh, these older atheists would say something like, well, it's true religion produces a lot of good social benefits, but it just can't be believed by a person of intellectual integrity. The new atheists are unwilling to concede any such benefits to religious belief. On their view, religion is not just intellectually groundless, it's positively harmful both to the individual and to society, and especially so in the political realm. Furthermore, they think that this harmfulness is not merely something that stems from extreme forms of religion or fanaticism. Rather, they argue even religious moderates, quote, provide protective coloration for their fanatical co-religionists. It's probably this second element of, of faith, uh, this second element in their view, that leads to the shrillness of the new atheist polemics. And it leads to a third element, which may be the most novel aspect of their thinking, a questioning of the principle of religious tolerance. Most unbelievers in the past have accepted the idea of religious freedom, wanting only to ensure that the principle extended to unbelief just as much as it did to belief. The new atheists, however, think that religion is so irrational and so harmful to society that it may be something that shouldn't be fully tolerated. While they aren't willing to go so far as to propose some kind of atheist inquisition that would have power to punish religious believers, some of them are willing to seriously consider whether restrictions should be put on the religious instruction of children. Hitchens, for example, says, if religious instruction were not allowed until the child attains the age of reason, we would live in a quite different world. There's a general view that religious beliefs are harmful enough that they at least deserve no special protections or privileged status. Here we see a genuine reversal, I think. Prior to the development in modern times of societies tolerant of religious belief, it was often thought that the lack of religious faith was something so harmful to society, as well as to the individuals who lack faith, that it should not be tolerated. Yet philosopher like Locke, for example, who's generally in favor of religious tolerance, even Locke says, well, you can't tolerate atheists. They would just mess up society. They would undermine society. So you could tolerate different religious views, but there's a limit to how far even a philosopher like Locke would go. Uh, so as a result of this belief that a lack of faith was harmful, people of goodwill and with sometimes the best of motives wound up persecuting religious dissenters. And of course, uh, some of the... Uh, the heroes who founded Acadia University were Baptists who had suffered uh, on the wrong end of this sort of persecution and stood up very strongly for religious freedom. I'm happy to say that I'm a Baptist myself, so we'll say something good for the Baptists here. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, the new atheists appear to think that the harmfulness of religious beliefs is so serious that it may justify policy policies of intolerance towards religion. We've thus gone from, let's say, at one period, intolerance of unbelief to tolerance to now perhaps people who are willing to support something that looks like intolerance of belief. So how should Christians respond? A comprehensive response to the new atheism would have to touch on all the issues I've just mentioned, and much good work has been done towards this end. And I won't even say anything about this because I'm not a biblical scholar, but obviously an important part of the response will have to be a response on the part of theologians, Old Testament scholars, and New Testament scholars on how the new atheists read the Bible and how they interpret the Bible because they often read the Bible in a very wooden, 
rigid fundamentalist ways so that they can criticize it. Hitchens is a, a great example. Um, but the other issues I have touched on, for example, the claim that Christian belief is incompatible with science has been examined and found wanting by philosophers such as Alvin Plantinga, as well as scientists such as physicist John Pokinghorn and biologist Francis Collins, and I recommend their works. The charge that religious belief in general and Christian belief in particular has been and continues to be ethically destructive also deserves a serious reply. Of course, Christians must honestly admit that the church, as well as many individual Christians, have often exhibited moral failures. And this is something that the Christian doctrine of sin implies should not be that much of a surprise to us. However, the narrative provided by the new atheists on the moral effects of Christian belief, both in the past and today, seems to me to be one-sided and inaccurate. They focus on the less than adequate ways Christians have expressed their faith, and they ignore or minimize the ways Christian love and compassion have changed society for the better in the past and also today. Good work has also been done in this area. I would cite, for example, philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff, his book, Justice, Rights, and Wrongs, from Princeton University Press. Wolterstorff has argued convincingly in this book that the important doctrine of human rights historically stems from biblical faith, and that even today there is no adequate replacement for a religious vision of human nature as a basis for human rights. Distinguished historian Jeffrey Burton Russell has recently answered many of the viral lies and legends that you find in New Atheist writings in his book, Clearing the Air, Exposing Myths About Christianity. And my Baylor colleague Rodney Stark, who's a sociologist of religion, in his book, The Victory of Reason, How Christianity Led to Freedom, Capitalism, and Western Success, may actually go too far in answering the New Atheist attack. I think Stark's narrative is perhaps a little unbalanced on the other side uh, of, the, of the scale. But nevertheless, as a balancing book, Stark makes many telling points. He argues that the success of science and the development of political freedoms were the outgrowth of religious views rather than something made possible by secularization. I think he makes a convincing historical case. Now, given the unoriginality of the new atheist intellectual attacks, one might well think that the most important area of response lies in this clearing of the historical air by re-examining the historical and ethical implications of faith. I do believe this kind of response is extremely important. The New Testament itself says, by their fruit you shall know them. And so the charge that Christian faith leads only to bad fruit must be confronted even while the church's mistakes are honestly admitted and repented of. But I believe it's also important to confront the new atheism on basic intellectual grounds. A failure clearly to articulate why reasonable people can believe that Christian faith is true plays right into their hands. Now it's true that the new atheists think religious beliefs have many more faults than being intellectually unreasonable. As I've said, on their view, religious beliefs are a prime source of suffering in today's world. But since the new atheists see themselves as committed to reason, particularly as exercised through science, the first sin of religious believers in their eyes is not to follow reason. Presumably, if the new atheists were convinced that some set of religious beliefs were solidly grounded in reason, that we had strong evidence of their truth, they would affirm all of us would be right to believe those claims, regardless of any untoward ethical implications the beliefs might have. Now, it's of course the case that a central belief of Christianity, as well as Judaism and Islam, and for that matter, many Hindus, is a belief in the existence of God, an all-perfect, all-powerful, all-knowing being who's responsible for the existence of everything other than himself in the universe. The central importance of belief in God can be seen by looking at the titles of the new atheists themselves. The God delusion, God is not great, the blind watchmaker, which puts in place of a personal creator God a blind, random, natural process. Traditionally, many Christian theologians and philosophers have responded to the charge that belief in God is unjustified by engaging in natural theology, offering arguments or pointing to evidence generally accessible to humans that supports belief in God. An influential popular form of natural theology was presented in the mid-20th century by C.S. Lewis in his 
well-read mere Christianity. Now, defenders of natural theology can still be found, particularly among Christian philosophers, and I'm going to say more about this below. But I think it's fair to say that natural theology is not prominent in the work of contemporary theologians, and even that many theologians, particularly Protestants, view natural theology with some suspicion and disdain. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to try to address the reasons for this suspicion and make a case for a kind of natural theology. First, I simply want to point out that this sort of relative silence on the part of theologians has given the new atheists a rhetorical advantage. One theme they constantly hammer is that religion has no rational basis. It is something based on faith. And they characterize faith simply as believing without evidence. Uh, Richard Dawkins re recounts with some contempt and glee a conference he participated in with theologians at Cambridge. And he claims that at this conference, his argument for atheism met with no rational response whatsoever. The theologians just didn't say anything to him. They were probably uh, looking at their shoes embarrassed but, uh, at the quality of the argument. But this is, he interprets it, they didn't know what to say. Here's a quote from uh, him. He says, the theologians of my Cambridge encounter, they were defining themselves into an epistemological safe zone where rational argument could not reach them. So the lack of a public voice that clearly defends the reasonableness of belief in God makes it appear that such belief has no reasonable ground. This may explain why the new atheists actually spend so little time engaging the case for religious belief they think that no serious case can be made. Religious belief just, quote, depends on faith. And Hitchens famously declares, what can be asserted without proof can be dismissed without proof. So since we don't offer any arguments, they don't even have to uh, offer any evidence against our beliefs. It is, I think, fairly clear that the new atheists, by and large, are what philosophers would call evidentialists in their epistemology. They hold that beliefs that are rationally justified must be based on evidence. In the case of religious beliefs, they are sure that the evidence is inadequate or even non-existent. So how should uh, Christians respond to this charge? One possibility is to attack evidentialism. There is a group of contemporary Christian philosophers, uh, among whom I'm actually sometimes grouped, who are called collectively reformed epistemologists. And they are inspired by John Calvin's claim that belief in God is not produced by arguments, but by what Calvin called the sensus divinitatis, a sort of natural faculty that prompts us to believe in God. And they've argued that if we believe in God in this way, that belief can be, quote, properly basic. It doesn't have to be based on evidence or arguments. It's one of our foundational beliefs. And therefore, according to them, Belief in God can be reasonable even if the believer has no arguments or propositional evidence that the belief is based on. So in this view, natural theology that consists of arguments for God's existence is not necessary for reasonable belief in God. Now, I'm actually very sympathetic to Reformed epistemology. I'm friends with Alvin Plantinga, his sort of most famous proponent, Nicholas Wolterstorff, and, and others. I actually believe its central contentions are correct, and I'm going to say later on why their views are useful and helpful. But I do think Reformed epistemology should not be the whole of our response to the new atheism. After all, to say that belief in God can be reasonable without argument or evidence does not imply there are no good arguments or evidence. It's probably true if we recognize that in addition to propositional evidence, there is also evidence that is non-propositional in character. It's probably true that the views of the Reformed epistemologists can be restated, redescribed in ways that don't sound quite so stark as I initially said. Um, but if all we say is belief in God can be reasonable without evidence, I'm afraid this will look to many lay people incapable of understanding the subtle epistemology that underlies the Reformed philosophers. This looks like a confirmation of the new atheist claim that there is no evidence for belief in God. And so it looks like we're playing right into their hands with this belief in God is properly basic move. Um, 
Now, arguments for God's existence have often been understood as offering the first element of what I have called two-stage apologetics. The first stage consists of arguments or reasons to believe in God. The second stage consists of arguments or reasons to believe that God has revealed himself in the history of Israel, in Jesus of Nazareth, and through the scriptures that Christians believe to be inspired by God. This strategy can be seen from the medievals, such as Thomas Aquinas, right through to the 20th century in thinkers such as C.S. Lewis and the prominent uh, Oxford philosopher Richard Swinburne. Despite the pedigree of this tradition, natural theological arguments have not been prominent, as I've said, especially among Protestant theologians. The reasons this is so are complex. One is the widespread impression that the arguments of natural theology were dealt a fatal blow by the Enlightenment philosophers Hume and Kant. Of course, if the arguments are not good arguments, Christians will have to rely on something else. But I suspect, uh, and I suspect that some theologians, particularly those in the liberal camps, have thought that something like this is true, even though in my view, the arguments from Hume and Kant that are alleged to be so devastating are far from decisive. And I often find it very curious that some people accept the conclusions of Hume and Kant and reject all their premises. That is, they don't actually like Kant's epistemology or his philosophy, they just like where he gets. So they accept the conclusion, but not the premises. But in that case, how can they say Kant has refuted these arguments? But there are certainly other reasons for the decline in natural theology other than these Enlightenment philosophers and their criticisms. One is the widespread suspicion that natural theology somehow undercuts or undermines the centrality of revelation. Now obviously natural theology is a kind of revelation too. Any knowledge of God is something that God makes possible by revealing himself. But traditionally people have spoken of God's special revelation in history, revelation given at a particular time, particular place, through particular people, and distinguish that revelation from the more general revelation that is captured in the natural theological arguments. Uh, and there's little doubt, I think, that the towering influence of Karl Barth has been very strong at this point in the rejection of natural theology. I'm far from being a Barth scholar, but I believe Barth had a number of different reasons to worry about natural theology, and I'm sympathetic to those reasons. Um, one of his worries was certainly that natural theology can lead to a kind of idolatry. If God is, as Barth thought, transcendent and wholly other to humans, then one might think that any knowledge of God we can come up with in our own devices, relying on human experience and human reason, this will inevitably fail to do justice to God's transcendence. We will end up creating God in our own image, giving a kind of confirmation of Feuerbach's critique of religion. And I'm sure that Barth thought that this was one of the problems with Nazi ideology and the way the Nazis uh, had corrupted uh, the church in Germany. And so part of his stand against Nazi ideology was connected to his stand against natural theology. Um, so on Barth's view, the, any adequate knowledge of God that we have must come through God's special self-revelation. Recently, a Christian philosopher named Paul Moser has also criticized attempts to argue for God's existence in the traditional way. On Moser's view, such arguments had best lead to what he calls thin theism, a set of beliefs about abstract metaphysical claims. However, Mo Moser argues, if there is a God, the crucial issue is our status before God. God is not interested merely in our knowing such propositions as God exists, Rather, God wants us to know himself and to acquire a proper relation to himself. A genuine knowledge of God would be gained through a process in which we come to understand our moral and volitional status in relation to God and God's authority. Traditional natural theological arguments are based on what Moser calls spectator evidence, evidence that can be had without any spiritual transformation on our part, and he thinks that this sort of evidence just doesn't serve the end. Of, trend, of personal transformation. Moser thinks then we must come to know God by being open to experiences of God and to God's self-revelation. Natural theolo theology is a mistake. It leads only to thin theism, which is of no real value. Genuine knowledge of God is grounded in a full-fledged encounter with God's self-revelation, where we must come to know God as God wishes us to know him. We must come to go know God on God's terms rather than forcing God 
to, so to speak, submit to our terms. Now, as I've already said, I'm really very sympathetic to what Bart says and to what Moser says and to many other people who've said similar things. But I think we can accept their claims and still see an important role for natural theology in responding to the new atheism. The key is to see natural theology not as providing us with an adequate positive knowledge of God, but as supporting what I call anti-naturalism. Suppose I agreed fully with the criticisms of Bart and Moser that are directed against natural theology. And suppose I'm not a religious believer. Uh, what does someone who is a religious believer, what does that person think the person who's not a believer should think in this situation? Does it mean that the unbeliever who is not turned to God in faith by hearing and responding to God's word or is not seeking God by being open to God's authority and correction, that the most reasonable view of the universe and our human place in that universe would be the view of atheism or some sort of naturalism that says nature is all there is, there's nothing beyond the physical and natural world. Should reasonable non-believers be atheists? I think the answer is no. To put things plainly, I want to claim a naturalist view of reality itself suffers from very deep problems. There are more things in heaven and earth than a naturalist can reasonably make sense of. Even someone who is not a full-fledged religious believer, or especially not a Christian, can understand the difficulties with naturalism. What I'm proposing then is that we reconceive natural theology as a defense of anti-naturalism. Many of the arguments of traditional natural theology point to aspects of the natural world that point beyond that world and they are things that naturalism cannot explain very well. There are elements in nature that point beyond nature. My own term for these elements is they are natural signs and I'm going to talk at length about the natural signs that point to God tomorrow night. Even if those natural signs do not give us genuine knowledge of God, they may help us to see that the natural world does point beyond itself towards a profound mystery. Natural theology then articulates questions that a reasonable person ought to ask. Even if the natural theologian cannot answer those questions satisfactorily, the questions point us towards being open to the kinds of answers that Bart and Moser want us to seek. So to put things as simply as possible, I deny that naturalism is the most reasonable view of reality one can take, even if one is not a Christian believer. To see how natural theology can help, one must have a clear understanding of the epistemic situation that confronts someone who is thinking about the merits of naturalism vis-a-vis -vis its rivals. In particular, one must have a clear view of where the burden of proof lies in relation to these questions, and also what kind of evidence for God one would expect there to be if God exists and if he created the universe and wants to have a relationship with us. I shall turn first to the issue of burden of proof. Now, it's clear that most atheists think that the burden of proof in relation to God lies with the religious believer. This assumption was famously articulated and defended by Anthony Flew in a well-known essay, The Presumption of Atheism, in which he argued that atheism is the default position intellectually. One should not be a theist without strong evidence. Belief in God is intellectually risky, while naturalism is safe ground. I believe this assumption seems right to many atheists because they think of God as if God were simply one more thing in the universe. Here's how they describe it. We, th we naturalists and you theists, we all agree that the universe contains dogs and cats and lions and tigers and trees and rocks. If we're scientifically sophisticated people, we'll also agree about electrons and quarks and black holes. But the naturalist thinks that the theist goes beyond this safe common ground and believes in one additional strange entity, namely God. Believing in God is like believing in the Loch Ness Monster or the Abominable Snowman or something like that. Surely, one might think, the person who believes in the Loch Ness Monster bears a burden of proof that the skeptic about such things does not shoulder. If God is, like the Loch Ness Monster, simply one more strange entity in the universe, then the religious, the religious believer would seem to bear a similar burden of proof. I agree with that. 
However, I believe this way of thinking about the issue is wrong-headed. God is not simply one more entity within the natural order on a par with other entities. To believe in God is to believe that the universe has a certain character. To disbelieve in God is to believe the universe lacks that character and has a very different character. The person who believes in God believes that each and everything that exists other than God exists because of God and God's continuously creative power. If God withdrew that power for even an instant, the universe would collapse into nothingness. Uh, the universe that God has made is seen as one that was created for a purpose. Part of that purpose is a con serve as a contest between good and evil, a contest in which the character of the universe gives us assurance that the good will ultimately win. The naturalist, on the other hand, believes that each and everything that exists as part of the natural order lacks this characteristic of existing because of God's creative activity. Everything just exists, quote, on their own. One might say that for the naturalist, the universe is one vast brute fact or else many, many brute facts. There is no reason or purpose behind the existence of the universe as a whole or the individual entities that compose it. Furthermore, we have no reason at all to think that good will ultimately triumph over evil or even that the contest between good and evil is a serious and significant contest. In other words, the theist and the naturalist don't just disagree about God, they disagree about everything. They disagree about the character of the universe. Each is committed to a worldview that includes a comprehensive perspective on what is real. Now it is, I think, reasonable for the believer in God to think, what reasons do I have for holding the universe has the character that it does? But it seems equally reasonable for the naturalist to reflect on the evidence for the truth of the naturalistic worldview. Moreover, it is by no means clear that the naturalistic worldview is somehow safer or less risky than a theistic worldview. So I claim no special burden of proof lies on the theist. Many of the new atheists and many naturalists in general fail to see this because they confuse a commitment to naturalism, which is a metaphysical view, with a commitment to natural science. Somehow they believe naturalism is supported by science and one commonly hears a naturalistic worldview described as a scientific worldview. However, the theist and the atheist do not, qua theist and atheist, disagree about any scientific questions at all. At least they don't have to. The question of naturalism is a question about whether nature is all there is. Science has currently understood is an attempt to gain knowledge of the natural world. But science by its very nature is not fit to investigate whether there is more to reality than the natural world that science investigates. The theist and the atheist both agree that there are scientific laws that describe the behavior of the natural world. The theist believes those laws hold because of God's creative activity. The atheist can give no such explanation. But there are no scientific experiments that can decide the question as to whether the natural world is all there is or the question as to whether or not the laws of nature are whole because of God or whole for no reason at all. Such questions are philosophical in nature and as is the case with most philosophical questions, it's not possible to prove beyond doubt that one answer to the questions is correct if we mean by a proof an argument that no reasonable person could doubt. In that sense, God's existence cannot be proven. I think most Christian philosophers would agree with that. But it's equally true that in that sense of proof, naturalism cannot be proven to be the correct metaphysical picture of things. Proof in this sense is an unrealistic ideal both for the theist and for the atheist. What is reasonable, however, is to ask ourselves which of these rival worldviews makes the most sense taking into account all that we know, all of our experience. The question that I want now to pose is what kind of evidence we should expect to find if God does exist? Now, even the atheist can recognize, of course, that it's reasonable to consider the existence of God as a kind of hypothesis. And as is the case with any hypothesis, we should consider what consequences would follow if that hypothesis were true. So if we assume that God exists and he's created human persons so that they can enjoy a relationship with God, 
it's surely reasonable to assume that some sort of knowledge of God would be possible for humans and that the grounds of that knowledge would be generally accessible. One would not think that the knowledge of God would require great philosophical learning or scientific sophistication. It would be exceedingly odd if one had to be a theoretical physicist and understand string theory to believe in God or have a PhD in philosophy and know all the five ways of Thomas Aquinas in order to come to know God. Rather, one would expect that a knowledge of God would be generally available to ordinary people. If there is evidence of God's reality then, we would expect that evidence to be fairly pervasive and easy to recognize. The claim that evidence for God would be widely available, I call the wide availability principle. So I'm committing myself to the wide availability principle. Uh, however, Christian theology has generally assumed not just that God desires humans to have a relation to him, but a relation of a certain kind. God desires humans to serve him freely, motivated by love of God's goodness, not out of coercion or fear. Given God's omnipotence and omniscience, if God's reality were too obvious, it would create difficulties for this goal. For it would be the height of foolishness for even a self-centered being to oppose a being who is omnipotent and omniscient. It's like the old joke about what do you feed a 600 pound elephant if he's in your living room and the answer is whatever he wants. It thus seems plausible to assume that though the evidence for God would be widely available, easily accessible, it would also be the kind of evidence that a person who wished to do so could dismiss or reject. We might thus expect the evidence to have a degree of ambiguity, to be such that it could be reinterpreted or explained away by those who do not wish to believe in God or who perhaps, who, who perhaps have been taught to think this way by those who do not wish to believe in God. The evidence would then be easily resistible even though widely available. I call this second constraint on the evidence for God the easy resistibility principle. Both of these principles are strongly suggested by some remarks made by Pascal in his Pensées. This is Pascal. I, I'm going to read a longer quote than you have uh, on the slide there. If God had wished to overcome the obstinacy of the most hardened, he could have done so by revealing himself to them so plainly that they could not doubt the truth of his essence. It was therefore not right that he should appear in a manner manifestly divine and absolutely capable of convincing all men. But neither was it right that his coming should be so hidden that he could not be recognized by those who sincerely sought him. Thus wishing to appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart and hidden from those who shun him with all their heart, he has qualified our knowledge of him by giving signs which can be seen by those who seek him and not by those who do not. There is enough light for those who desire only to see and enough darkness for those of a contrary disposition. Now Pascal in this quote was very likely thinking of the knowledge of the incarnate Christ rather than natural knowledge of God, but it's surely in the spirit of his thought to apply the same concerns to the latter. I therefore think it's appropriate to describe the wide accessibility principle and the easy resistibility principle as the two Pascalian constraints on evidence for God's existence. Tomorrow night, I'm going to uh, talk about signs for God's existence, natural signs that meet these two Pascalian constraints. And I'm going to argue that they're powerful, that they have real force. I conclude tonight that to do natural theology, we must get three things right. First, we must have a correct view of the goal of natural theology, construing it as primarily a defense of anti-naturalism rather than as giving us any kind of substantive, complete, positive knowledge of God. In other words, it says there's something beyond the natural world. Maybe it's like the Christian God. Maybe it's like the Greek gods or the Nordic gods. We don't know, but there's something out there that we should be open to. Second, we must have the right view of where the burden of proof lies, recognizing there is no presumption of atheism, but that all rival worldviews are accountable to reason. Finally, we must have the right view of the kind of evidence needed and that it is reasonable to seek. Tomorrow night, I'm going to try to show, as I've said, there are natural signs of God that God has placed in the natural world and in human experience 
that these signs satisfy the wide accessibility principle as well as the easy resistibility principle. These signs, I'm going to try and argue, do make rational belief in God possible. In fact, if we have the right kind of epistemology, we may go beyond saying that rational belief is possible. We might even claim that they make knowledge of God possible. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, Professor Evans, for that very, very stimulating and very clearly presented lecture. I'm sure we'll get some uh, interesting discussion right now for questions, answers. We have a roving microphone. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and then wait until you get the microphone. And don't let go of it, young man. You hang on to it. We want to hear your brief questions and not speeches. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Somebody who would like to go first. Over here. OK. Yes, right over here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm to hold on to it. <laughs> the, Don the Donahue effect. Um, my question kind of relates the uh, the fears of Protestants in embracing um, natural theology. Um, I really liked your three points, and I guess I was just thinking about adding a fourth. And I I just want to get your opinion or thought on that. Is that the uh, Protestants are are we afraid that we'll come up with um, some kind of a reasonable approach like intelligent design and have it all fall apart because next month there's some new scientific discovery? or uh, come up with another uh, reasonable approach to creation and have it again fall apart the next year and so on. And th that, that fear of being, uh, getting the egg on the face or being shamed by not being current with the science yeah. is pulling us away from this. That, that's a great question. Uh, so um, I, think, I think that has happened. I mean. If you look at Thomas Aquinas' arguments for God's existence, at least some of them don't really work very well for us today because they're couched in terms of Aristotelian physics and none of us believe Aristotelian physics is the right physics. Um, and so we worry reasonably that if we hitch our wagon to the latest scientific theory and the latest attempt to argue for God's existence uh, on the basis of science, of course, are the, is the so-called fine-tuning argument, where uh, physicists have said, you know, in order for a world like ours to be possible, the, cons the, uh, the constants of the natural world, the laws of nature, have to be incredibly fine-tuned. There's this logical space that's huge, and, and yet all of these constants have to be within a very, very narrow range given all that, and the, that just couldn't all be by chance. Uh, and, and those arguments have, have been very persuasive to some people. Actually, uh, Anthony Flew, whom I quoted tonight about the presumption of atheism, before he died, Anthony Flew became a theist, or at least a deist. He said he believed in God, and it was a result of the fine-tuning argument. I don't want to dismiss arguments like that, uh, I think that there may very well be something there that's interesting. But I would be surprised if the fine-tuning arguments or arguments of that sort were the only or sole means of gaining knowledge of God. For one thing, it would be really strange if we had to wait until contemporary physics was <laughs> discovered before anybody knew there was a God. That would be weird. That would be a violation of the wide accessibility principle for sure. So what I want to argue is that these natural signs that I'm going to uh, rely on are obvious and evident features of human experience that are virtually universal, not dependent on any scientific theory, so that no matter how much our science changes, the signs are still there and they're still present and they're still powerful. Now one issue is, uh, are some of these signs such that science can explain them away? So I still have to deal with science. But it makes a difference um, philosophically uh, whether you're making a chess move or a counter move. <laughs> and here, uh, what I want to say is what fuels belief are the signs. Now, if you're relying on the signs, you're still subject to what a philosopher would call a defeater. Someone may say, you think that's so because of this? I have a powerful argument against your view. I have evidence that your view is false. 
And if I'm a reasonable person, I have to consider that challenge. I have to consider that defeater. So I think that people who want to base, uh, say that belief in God is reasonable, partly on the basis of these natural signs, do have to pay attention to the arguments of people like Dawkins who think that uh, Darwinism provides a kind of defeater for some of these signs. But the signs are still there. And I'm gonna, uh, what I'm going to try and do is simply argue that there is no defeater here. The, the signs are not, they're neither supported by scientific theories nor are they threatened by them. And therefore, they are not subject partly to that kind of worry. Very good. Good question. Someone else? Yes, there in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Evans, for your very stimulating lecture. I do want to ask you a question. I'm thinking of the blurb that I read recently by Michael Ruse, the highly respected philosopher of science, atheist professor from Florida State University, who said when he read God Delusion, it made him embarrassed to be an atheist. <laughs> so my question for you is, is new atheism a fad? Or is it something that, as professors and theologians, we'll have to deal with uh, in the coming years and decades? What are you seeing with your reading and writing? Well, I guess I'm inclined to wish it were a fad, but I, that might be wish fulfillment on my part. And the new atheists are always eager to see religious people being accused of being wish fulfillment people. So I guess I'm inclined to think that they have gained enough, enough cultural traction there are enough kind of lonely unbelievers out there who suddenly have found each other uh, and these books provide a kind of, of, of symbolic voice for them collectively. They feel like, oh, here, here are my heroes. Uh, and, and many of these people, they find each other on the internet. They uh, reinforce uh, each other. Uh, uh, they have this charming sort of way of describing themselves as the brights implying that those of us who believe are the dumbs, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, however intellectually sort of lightweight this is, uh, there's a lot going on there. And I guess I, my expectation is that this is going to continue to be uh, at least a, a cultural force that we have to deal with. And I think it would be a mistake, as, as I've tried to say tonight, it's a mistake to say, just because their arguments aren't very good, they're just repeating these cliches. Christianity is unscientific, and then they have all these sort of myths and legends about Christianity is responsible for all the bad things in the world, all the wars and, and the crusades. I mean, Steven Pinker has this amazing book where he argues that uh, we now live in the most peaceful world we've ever lived in, and it's because of the decline of religion. <laughs> I don't know what world he's living in, but <laughs> I don't think the world that I see looks very peaceful or unviolent in the last hundred years. Uh, yes, right over here. Um, I'd just like to um, emphasize the, in my view, the extreme importance of your view that we have to take this seriously. Uh, that simply brought home to me because the wife of uh, my godson, a uh, good practicing Lutheran, um, whose wife has been extremely influenced by Dawkins' books, uh, primarily his arguments that, that uh, religion has been more harmful than good. So this puts a lot of pressure on their family. She's very, very uncomfortable with the idea of the kids going to Sunday school. Uh, he's very, very uncomfortable with the fact that she doesn't want the kids to. So we're not talking about a cultural thing here. We're, we're talking about something that, in my opinion, there's no congregation uh, that anybody here is involved in that's not uh, dealing with us. And um, so I, I, I wonder the extent, when you say that you don't think this is a fad, um, I agree with you, I don't think it's a fad. I'm wondering to what extent it's cultural in the sense that when you have things like 
the McLaughlin Report and other things constantly on TV where people become well known and famous by yelling silly things at each other. Um, does that maybe, you know, is that part of the picture? The culture mm -hmm. we're in has become not just adversarial, but s adversarial in an odd way? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what to say about that, but I, I agree with you that, that this is an issue that can divide families and communities and, and cause. I mean, I teach at a Christian university. Baylor prides itself on being the world's largest Baptist university, although less than half of our students are Baptists, and I think less than half our faculty are Baptists, but nevertheless, uh, we're, we're a Christian school. We have many students, I have students in every class who are atheists, and many of them have been affected by reading uh, these folks. Partly, it's the, I mean, Hitchens, for example, and I have to confess, I really love reading Hitchens. He is a wonderful stylist. I mean, he's, he's polemical, he's sometimes nasty, but he's fun to read. He knows how to turn a phrase. He knows how to turn words. And I think uh, people are, are shaped by the power of the, uh, of the rhetoric and the style, and it's, it's very influential. So we have to get down to the hard work of dealing both with the philosophical issues that are raised in epistemology, philosophy of religion, also the issues in biblical studies and biblical interpretation. They have these sort of, uh, in, in many ways, uh, I would say their readings of the Bible are akin to the readings of the fundamentalists who are their antipodes. They often have a kind of very narrow fundamentalist interpretation of the Bible, and then they use that as their foil. Uh, so we have a lot of, and, and we have students who aren't very biblically or theologically knowledgeable, and so they are easy pickings. Go ahead, Tim. Professor Evans, thank you for your lecture this evening. If we follow the uh, argument within your lecture of adopting uh, Pascalian constraints, the wide availability, easy resistibility. Uh, m one of my questions, uh, or my question would be, why would we feel it necessary to be an apologist anyway? Do we not find ourselves perhaps walking down the trail of a neo-Calvinist and saying, well, of course, there will be those created who will see the wide availability and they'll accept, and, and those who are resisting, well, that's also part of the natural course, and, and frankly, we don't need to be an apologist because of the way in which God has revealed God's self and also provided enough resistance for non-believers? Well, it, it depends on how much of a Calvinist you want to be <laughs> here. But um, I'm, I am inclined, and I'm going to say uh, clearly, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about Reformed epistemology again tomorrow night. I'm going to talk about the idea of belief in God as properly basic. And basically, I'll, I'll give a little preview here, but what I want to say is that these natural signs which I call evidence for God's reality, can work in a spontaneous way without any argument or inference to produce belief that is not based on any arguments or propositional evidence. Uh, so I think that there's a way of construing what the Reformed epistemologists say that is compatible with saying that there is evidence for God's reality. It's just that that evidence is not propositional in character. It doesn't have to be. We can also, in my view, I'm going to argue, we can reflect on these signs, talk about them propositionally, construct arguments. I am myself, for example, a proponent of moral arguments for God's existence. Uh, I have a book coming out from Oxford University Press in January on God and moral obligation, where I try to mount a very strong argument that if you believe in morality and you believe in the objectivity of morality, and I argue that you should, you ought to believe in God because that's the only adequate explanation for morality. So I think we can give arguments, but they're still going to meet these Pascalian constraints. And on my view, when we give an argument, what we're really doing is we're taking this sign and making it the focus of our reflection and articulating it. And that's why, if you might ask yourself this question, over the centuries, going back to Plato and Aristotle, We've had all these arguments for God's existence, and there are two things true about them. One is, they never convince everybody. The second is, they always retain appeal to some people. They always seem to have force. We can never quite forget them. 
and yet they don't convince everybody. And I think seeing these arguments as attempts to articulate these natural signs is in fact what's going on here. So this is my attempt to sort of make sense of the debate in, uh, uh, that has occurred over the centuries. Very good. Yes, <coughs> Sam. Uh, George Marsden has written a lot about Scottish common sense realism and how it shaped and formed a lot of um, Protestant thinking in, in America at least. And I'm just wondering, in light of that, uh, two things. One is, are you opening yourself up to the same dangers that that whole um, epistemological basis opened itself up to with your wide availability principle? And secondly, where that influenced the English-speaking world primarily, is this whole debate just an English-speaking world thing? Or does it reach into the continent and around the world? Good, good question. Um, it's a, this is actually a complex issue historically, and, and George and I have talked about this a lot. I, I'll have to say, George Marsden's one of my best friends. We play golf all summer together in western Michigan. I don't spend this, my summer's in Texas. It's too hot. Uh, and George is a passionate golfer, and so am I. So anyway, uh, here's the story. The common sense realism that had such a strong impact on North America, and I don't know the Canadian scene as well, but I do know that common sense realism was very important in the early Protestant colleges in the US. But the common sense realism that shaped the old Princeton and, and many of the other uh, evangelical colleges was in my view, and George will agree with this, it was a debased form of the original Scottish philosophy. And so the problems that you see in Scottish common sense realism as it developed in the US are not necessarily found if you trace this philosophy back to Thomas Reed and its roots. Tomorrow night, I'm actually going to spend about 20% of my lecture talking about Thomas Reed because this idea of natural signs is actually a Reedian notion. I, I stole this idea from Thomas Reed, from his philosophy of perception, and I'm applying it to philosophy of religion. And I'm willing to defend Reed's epistemology, not in all of its details, but it's basically the right approach, not just for Christians, but for anybody. I think it's a sensible epistemology. And I think that it's, it's, a, it's a way forward. And if you look at Christian philosophy today, uh, philosophers like Planiga, Walter Storff, and many others, you'll find that the influence of Reed has been just incalculable, tremendous. Uh, but there are big differences between Reed, as Reed himself developed, and what finally, a hundred, hundred years later, uh, as his followers had sort of uh, boulderized his philosophy and I think messed it up. So that's, that's my answer. I think we can be Reedians without uh, being vulnerable to the kind of problems you do, do you see in 19th century uh, common sense realism. David, uh, Andrea. Hi, I'm just wondering, do you think that the new atheists um, confuse God as a supreme being rather than like the ground of being or even being itself in which creation participates, as Thomas Aquinas might say? And do you think that this is the fault of Christians for having a very radically different doctrine of God than what many of the doctors of the church would have held? Well, I do think... I do think that um, they do think of God in very inadequate ways. I mean, they, they don't have an adequate understanding, I think, a deep understanding of, of traditional Christian theology. And that does shape. I mean, you see this, for example, in the debate between Dennett and Planiga. Uh, Planiga presents his ideas uh, for the idea that belief in God is properly basic. And Dennett tries to refute him by offering a parody. He says, oh, I believe in Supermanism as a properly basic view. And he describes Superman, born, you know, from the planet Krypton and grew up here and he has these powers. How do I know it's true? I don't, it's properly basic. I just have this natural tendency to believe in Superman. And Plantinga responds in the debate by saying, but look, uh, Superman and God are just not very much alike at all. One is the ground of the universe and the other is a sort of creature in the universe and how can you claim these are parallel? And Dennett just can't see the difference. 
He says they're just the same. So I think you're, you're right. Now, whether that means we have to say that God is simply the ground of being, as Tillich says, and not talk of God as a being at all, that may be a bridge too far. I'm willing to say that God is, that there is an analogy of being. Obviously, in some ways, when we talk about God, we must think of him as a being because we think of him as acting, as having knowledge, a, someone to whom we can have a relationship. So there, there must be a kind of, of center of, of reality there. Uh, but, but nevertheless, God's being is not at all like the being of finite creatures. And that's part of the point I was trying to make when I said God is not like the Loch Ness Monster. He's not just one more thing added to your uh, ontology. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Greg Monette in the back. Yeah, hi. Actually, it's sort of a follow-up to that question. Uh, and it's sort of, um, can you think of any other examples of basic beliefs that people disagree over, sort of like the existence of God. And I'll give you a, a basically a 30 second reason why I'm asking that question. Uh, a number of uh, atheist friends and I, we read through William Lane Craig's Reasonable Faith. And in chapter one, he says that even if the evidence should turn on Christianity, that because he has the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, therefore he would think that Christianity is true, regardless of how scholars have construed the evidence. And there are many Christians that don't necessarily feel an emotional presence of the Holy Spirit. So without doubting the Holy Spirit's active. So what do you do with that? And do you think that's a, a sound argument for God's existence that uh, regardless of the evidence, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit confirms that? I certainly wouldn't use the language regardless of the evidence. Uh, because I think reasonable people always have to be willing to consider challenges, defeaters, uh, potential or alleged defeaters for their faith. That doesn't mean that one has to consider every possible de uh, alleged defeater. None of us spend very much time worried about the arguments of flat earthers or, you know, trying to think about their objections to our, uh, our beliefs. So we don't think that every challenge is uh, worth considering, but, uh, but nevertheless, we do have to take seriously. So, for example, in my book, The Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith, I do consider uh, the, the claim that, uh, that our belief in Christ can be warranted by the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. But I also say that even that's true, and I defend it as true, that one would still have to take seriously the claims of skeptical New Testament scholars that they have some sort of powerful evidence that, say, to take an extreme view, which Hitchens actually endorses, uh, that Jesus never even existed or, or he was totally unlike, you know, uh, just a simple rabbi who gave us uh, moral uh, teachings encapsulated in Q, the earliest Christian document, of course. We all know that, right? Uh, <laughs> until the early church got together and manufactured the passion narratives. <laughs> I mean, that, some of those arguments, in my view, are not very strong, but if they were stronger, perhaps they would be a problem. But, uh, but, but one has to, I think, be willing to consider them. I do think it's important in thinking about the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit to, to think about this. As Planiga and the Reformed epistemologists want to talk about this, we shouldn't construe the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit simply as a kind of, of mystical experience which is supposed to count as evidence. On a part. So it's a matter of comparing, let's say, this mystical experience with other kinds of evidence and seeing which is stronger. And then you have the worry, but what if I don't have these mystical experiences? Perhaps I'm a very prosaic person and I don't have much in the way of mystical experience. Planiga, when he wants to talk about the witness of the Holy Spirit, what he wants to say is the witness of the Spirit is simply whatever the Spirit does to convince you that the gospel is true. It may not be an experience at all. It may just be a conviction, a feeling that this is the way it has to be. I know God is speaking to me, but there's no experience that I point to. Uh, because in his epistemology, I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow night, one of the great divides in contemporary epistemology is the divide between epistemological externalism and internalism. Externalists say, knowledge is basically a matter of whether I am rightly related to my environment, to my world. Am I such that my faculties are tracking the world? I have reliable faculties that are functioning well, giving me true beliefs. 
And if I've got the right kind of reliable relationship to the external world, what I have are, are and if they're true beliefs, then they count as knowledge. Internalists say, knowledge is a matter of what is accessible to my consciousness. It all must be justifiable by something I'm aware of consciously. Externalists don't think that. So how you think about the internal witness of the Holy Spirit might be different depending on whether you're an internalist or an externalist. And it's important to remember that the Reformed epistemologists are all like Thomas Reed, externalists on this question. I'll say more about that tomorrow. This will be our last question for tonight. I don't have the question uh, carefully written, but I'll uh, do my best here. In terms of the stock arguments, uh, the first stock argument that I see in the notes, where it says religious belief has no rational basis and is incompatible with science, I happened to uh, catch Dawkins in an interview and he espoused the multiverse uh, theory when it comes in terms of the origin of the universe. And uh, he believed that that would dismiss the anthropic principle of the fine-tuning, which yeah. of course flu, uh, you know, that convinced flu. Um, yet there's no, there's no scientific evidence to support the multiverse theory, even though he thought that that's the probable cause of the current universe in which we exist. And so my question is, have you come across any other examples that would lay the burden of proof on the new atheists? Yeah, the, the question of the, of the multiverse is, uh, is an interesting one. One does have some suspicion or worry that some of the atheists are flocking to this simply as a way of evading the fine-tuning argument. Uh, but... Uh, I'm not a philosopher of science, and I'm, I don't know that I'm the best person to address these issues, but I would just say people who are knowledgeable, like Robin Collins, for example, uh, Messiah, or Del Ratch, recently uh, retired from Calvin, they're inclined to think that the multiverse doesn't really help the atheists very much at all, even if it's true. Because even if there is a multiverse, you still are going to need some sort of multiverse generator. You're going to need some kind of physical mechanism to do the generating. And it's likely the same problem that we have for our universe will reoccur in whatever process uh, does all the replication of the multiverse. So um, th it's not at all clear that the multiverse is a cure-all for uh, the problems the new atheists may have with the fine-tuning argument. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give Professor Evans a round of applause. Thank you for all your questions and comments.